It's happened to all of us. When entering or leaving the woods in the pitch black, we see something, we hear something not quite right. And it makes you wonder, is there something really there? Or is it merely an overreactive imagination? As outdoorsmen, we seem to experience these things more than most. Throughout human history, all around the world, on every continent, every region, in every culture, there are stories, legends, of hairy giants, eight men, the hairy man. It is known by many names throughout history. Barmanu, Yeren, Yaoi, Almas, Rock Ape, Yeti, Sasquatch, Bigfoot. The Klalem tribe, which inhabited modern-day Mount St. Helens, has a legend of mountain giants, a tribe of harsh, hairy men, cannibals, that they had to fight and drive back into the mountain. In 1924, in the same area, miners claimed to be attacked by what they called eight men, or as they referred to them, the mountain devils. One has to wonder where these stories come from. Are they simply folklore? But as I've learned over the years about folklore and legends, there's usually a hint of truth in them. This was a while ago, I was a teenager, so this is gonna be sometime around 2007, 2008. Uh, we were on an unnamed island in the Mississippi River uh, in an unnamed Midwestern state. Um, the geography, the general geography of Midwestern is important because that kind of gives some, some play as far as what this might have been. But this was an island that was very thick, a lot of thick underbrush. Um, it was very remote. Pretty much the only access to it was by boat. There used to be an old land bridge. but. This island, again, well, we still hunt there, so I'm not going to say the name, but it has a it has an ominous supernatural name to it. So that just kind of adds to the uh, to the uh, the allure of what this might have been in the mystery. But we were hunting. The full story is we got out of the boat. It's October. It's warm weather, and I'm walking up the bank to go hunting into this island, and I've got my stand on my back and my bow again, uh, and I walk right into a yellow jacket's nest. And I think I counted about 14 tags on my neck and back. And that'll give you a headache and make you, that just kind of ruins your day when that happens. So that was the starting point of this event. And then didn't see a deer all afternoon. I remember I got a headache sitting in the stand, sitting there sweating this October. It started to get dark. And <clears throat> so where I sat up was uh, there was a small little drainage ditch and the deer were feeding on these little green browse that were growing in the little wet area. In theory, I never saw any deer, but that's what I was hunting on. I just remember very vividly, it was about 10 minutes to dark. I was probably 250 yards approximately from the riverbank, and the riverbank is to my east and to my west in that little low drainage area, which the low drainage area is basically, I mean, it's probably less than 30 feet. You know, it's just, a, it's just, and it's like, when I say a low drainage area, it's like a foot or two lower than everything else. It's very, it's very vague there, but it was just a little bit of an opening there where, you know, that was the first place for water when it did flood. But it was probably 60, 70, 80 yards, and there was a little brush there. But I, I very vividly saw something walking or hobbling, however you want to say it. And again, the geography, it, it was very, it was black for sure. If it wasn't black, it was dark brown. But uh, it, it was very distinguishable that this wasn't the typical shade of gray that a deer is, the shade of gray or brown. And then <clears throat> we're thinking, well, what could be black out there? You know, the first things that come to mind in the South and the and in the Midwest is would be um, like a bear or a pig. But where this was, I mean, there's no record of a wild boar or a wild pig being in this state. So I don't know what it was, except that it came basically north to South, crossed the little drainage and I just remember doing a double take and thinking what the heck is that and it was disproportionate in the length and width like if I have thought it was a even a black bear or a wild pig whatever it seemed taller than it should have been longer and in my mind it was maybe maybe three feet long but it was like it was three feet high and in my head it should have been longer wider rather than it should have been taller did it give you the impression that whatever it was could have been walking by people? 
it had a that was and again we've talked about this it had a strange gate that's what made me what the heck is that because it, it definitely had a strange kind of a hobbling gate like if it was on four legs like it had a gimp leg at, at a minimal you know or like i said it was taller than it should have been and all of this is as it's getting dark like i was in the, it was it was like five minutes before time to climb down like i don't know what it was i know it was black i know it had an abnormal gait and i know it seemed disproportionate um and then it was it was almost like a phantom i mean it was there for just a few seconds like maybe i, I saw it hobble maybe three or four strides but it was enough for me to no, that's definitely like it was enough for me to recognize that's definitely something there and that's definitely something moving and it was enough for my brain to get really confused as to the identity did, did you ever hear anything never heard anything never heard a footstep Steps. nothing no i don't really get afraid but i just remember thinking that's kind of weird like you're climbing down in the dark there's no i don't have a firearm i probably got a pocket knife and a bow you know and it was about 250 walk back 250 yard walk back to the river nothing happened i, I don't to this day man i don't know what it was we're kind of foolish if we think we're the top of the food chain like there's things out there that uh that we can't explain but um, we're friends you know me i'm particularly a, a harsh critic of these kind of stories because it's just we'll never know that was 15 years ago we'll the mississippi know. river itself holds an allure to it this will not be the only strange occurrence near this island the alton story so y'all seen alton on the channel and he may have a different recollection. This has been a long time ago. So, Alton, I'm sorry. I'm going to look at the camera like I'm not supposed to. I'm sorry, Alton, if you don't remember this like this. This is how it stood out in my mind. This has been more than 10 years ago. Alton uh, and me went to, to go deer hunting. And um, we would hit a couple public land spots kind of close to the camp that we were staying at. And then... On the Mississippi River, there is a piece of called and it's on Google Maps, just public land. So if you have a boat and can get to it, you can go hunt. And Alton and some other people that we've gone to church with had good luck there. So me and Alton were, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'd have been out, I guess, a day or two already. Scouted it first day we'd gotten there. Okay, we got it. Well, I don't know if any of y'all have been on the Mississippi River at 4 30 in the morning it's ex a it's tr extremely dark but a lot of times it's extremely foggy so alan's in the boat and i back us down the boat dock at this boat launch you know again 4 30 in the morning there's nobody out there but me and Alton. and there's one pale orange uh street light at the top of the boat ramp you know uh like a horror movie pale street you know orange light well i back out and down he's waiting on me i park the truck lock the truck up get in the boat without him and all we know we have to do is go north in the river and you know at this point the river's i don't know maybe a half mile wide it's not a full mile wide but it's still it's still a big old river and uh we start heading north and we see the light behind us kind of to our left disappear me and Alton are just kind of riding along, and it's just foggy. And, you know, we can look over the side of the boat, and you can see the waters headed downstream. Okay. We got a GPS, and, you know, GPS is just kind of fuzzy. You know, it, it didn't really work. We didn't quite have all the maps downloaded on it like we should have. I think we bought it on the way up there. And this was before super smartphones, so we didn't have anything on our phone. And uh, all of a sudden, we start coming up on a light and it's a pale orange light all right man that's that's funny that's it's gotta be like a barge or something like that as we get closer it's the boat ramp that we put in at and somehow going north upstream we wound up being south downstream of the boat launch and we pulled right back up to the boat launch that we had launched at. Now, I remember standing without him, you know, holding the spotlight up to try to see the way, and it was all fog, but Alton did not turn that boat around. And somehow, however it happened, we wound up back at that boat launch. 
And that was probably one of the eeriest moments I think I've ever had of when we looked at each other and went, we weren't trying to get back here. <laughs> ah, yeah, that one was a weird one. A legend just as old as Sasquatch. Our tales of werewolves. The French trappers refer to them as the Loup Guru. Again, these stories can be found all over the world. In ancient Egypt, their statues of the god Anubis is that of a man with a dog head. As compared to the stories and the claimed accounts of Bigfoot, those who claim to see the dog man seem to get the impression it is of more of a spiritual nature. Native American folklore tells of a creature called the Wendigo or shapeshifter that often is described as a coyote that looks like a man and walks upright. We were out to, uh, hog hunting at night, had a thermal scope, and you know, we, get, we get in there just a little before dark, you know, right at dusk, night starts falling, good and dark, we're on a, on the main road through the property, and you know, just sitting there watching. Very little activity, nothing's really coming through. Then all of a sudden, I see something step out into the road, and we're hunting in a in a ground blind, you no, know, just a little pop up blind. Something steps out into the road, and it's interesting because of where it stepped out was just enough out of frame from this trail camera I have in the road, and uh, it steps out, and this is kind of meandering just kind of looking around headed down the road straight at us you see it through your thermal scope yeah see, seeing it through the thermal scope i'm just watching all this through thermal yeah. and um the way this thing was shaped it was i would describe it as having the profile of a cross between a wolf and a bear and its legs were at least twice as long as they should be for the size that it was. And I just not thinking anything of it, just I just not a clue what, what I was looking at. <clears throat> and uh I don't I wouldn't say I don't think it knew that we were there. Uh it was just Seemed like a very off guard, just kind of cruising along the road, just checking things out. And I'll pop a shot off at this thing. And the way this thing got up to move was so unnatural as if it was like gearing up to get onto two legs. And at the time where this was, the road was uh, rather narrow from tree line to tree line. And uh, also, I'm watching it through a thermal scope, and I'll, all I have is the frame of that. And so I never saw it fully get up on its back two legs, but I could tell it's gearing up to get on, get on two legs and spread out of there. Get out, go out, look around. Not a lick of blood anywhere. And, you know, I could contribute it. It's like, okay, maybe I just flat out missed it. Except for just a few nights later in that exact same spot, did it like everything exactly the same. Shot a hog and dropped it right there. I have no adjustments to my rifle or scope or anything. Everything was exactly the same. What what caliber were you, were you using? It was a 308 Winchester. Mm. Probably 150 grains, I reckon. Over the past 10 years, a mysterious occurrence has taken place. More and more people report seeing strange lights or orbs floating through the forest all over the world. There are pictures, videos, documented events. And as you dig throughout history, these strange lights seem to be there for hundreds of years. What are they and what purpose do they serve? No one knows. Me and Turner were out in Camp Shelby, riding around, you know, seeing if we could pop some uh, coyotes or hogs. 
and uh, definitely not deer. I don't do it. I'm a I deer. would never, <laughs> unless. <laughs> so, as I remember it, Will had talked me into going to this military base, which is near where we live. And it's public land and national forest all around it. And uh, we go down, and I'm pretty sure the range we go down was range 50 Delta. And uh, we go down, nobody's out there. It's it's just us, you know. And I, I know this range. I know that that range ends as, as far as you can see, where where the burn is, that's it. It does nothing goes on beyond that. From behind the burn, behind the tree line, I look up and it, and I didn't know what it was. Is uh, the way I describe it, and I've seen this twice in my life now. It is light, but it doesn't emit light. A light just comes up. And it's climbing, and we're watching it, and it's climbing. And then it just hangs there. And it's not, it's not like a flare, you know, where a flare would have a tail to it. You see it, and it's a flickering light, but it doesn't have a tail, like a, a shooting star or a flare or anything. It's a ball, it's a sphere, but it's not producing light around it. It's bright enough where you can see it from a couple hundred yards off but it doesn't, there's no light under it or around it. It's not emitting light like a, like a spotlight or, or even a street light. It just climbs up and it, then it just kind of hangs there. And it was a, more, more of a white light, to, a, white, a, a white light to a light yellow. But it, it comes up out of the tree line and it just sort of hangs there. And I'm, you know, leaning into the windshield and I'm like, Will, what, what is this? And as soon as it hangs there, Turner goes, the Turner's on his in the passenger seat looking up like this and goes, Will, what's that? It's like, well, we ain't finding out. He just snatches it into gear and gasses it. We Darsky and Hutch 180 out of there. So. The second time I seen this was earlier this year this is you know several several years later i was driving uh, home i was driving my night route i was on uh, interstate 59 in uh, meridian mississippi and uh i was getting sleepy and i uh, went to pull off the off ramp and uh exit 156 right there before you come into meridian i come to the top of the ramp and there's woods there uh, to the north of the highway and I know looking at the map there's like a swamp back there and above that swamp above those trees was a sphere a lot like what me and Will saw all those years before except it was a, a emerald green I could see it so clear clear as day it, it, it was an emerald green and it looked to my eye it didn't look like a star or something, something that was far away and really big. It looked like it was about a 75 yards away and about the size of a manhole cover, like three, four feet in diameter. But it come up and it flashed this brilliant emerald green. It was more green around the outside and it got more white as it got to the center. And it just kind of hovered there a second and then it went out. And I sat there in my truck a second at the top of the off ramp and rubbed my eyes and just uh, I, again I got out of there I don't know what it was I, I don't care to know what it was I want no part of it so on the note Turner's talking about uh, Turner had taken some time off and I was filling in for him on the night run and got completely done, got to the spot he was talking about, didn't see anything. Two lane road, you know, one o'clock in the morning. And, you know, this, this road doesn't have a lot of people on it in the daytime, and it's got nobody on it at night. I am coming down 
and I, and I drive this road every day to work and back from work. I know every fence on it, know every light pole. I know just about everything on this one. I've been driving it every day for a year and a half. I'm coming down um, a farm is on my right and I know the fence row and I know that the gate going into this fence row has two telephone poles kind of making this really tall um, entrance to this cow pasture. Well, as I get closer, there's a light on top of one of the cow poles or uh, of the telephone poles. And you know, it's 20, 25 feet in the air. And uh, I thought, man, you know, I, I don't remember them putting a light in there. You would see it in the daytime because I had seen those telephone poles and there was nothing on them. Well, they put in security lights. But I like Turner was saying, this light, when you see a light, you know, in a, in a park, you can see what's dropping down, the light that's hitting the ground. There's nothing at the bottom of this telephone pole. And it almost looks like um, an old fuzzy TV. It's, it's, the light is textured, is the way I describe it. As I come up to this light, I go, man, that's a that's an odd security light. I don't really think much about it, but it intrigued me, so I'm watching it in my pickup truck, and as I get right beside it, it's almost like it was two-dimensional, like it was on a piece of paper. And when I get right beside it, it vanishes. I thought, well, that's, you know, man, it was a reflection off of my headlights off of something else. It was just something I just sweep it, sweep it around the road. I go about another half mile down the road and I'm coming up on a bridge crossing the river in a small two-lane bridge and it's a good straightaway coming up to the bridge and I look in my rearview mirror and see a, a, a motorcycle headlight a single headlight and I go man you know it's odd that a motorcycle will be out here this late you know 1 30 in the morning on an old country road but it's Again, it's not casting a beam. It's not pushing anything forward. And as I watch it in my rearview mirror, it's the same pale, almost like an off-white texture, like it's fuzzy. And that kind of scares me a little bit because I'm like, I just saw that light on top of a telephone pole 25 feet off the ground. And now it is coming up on me fast. And I, and I just go ahead and keep talking to myself, well, it's, it's just gotta be a motorcycle. So I kind of slow down a little bit. Well, this light starts darting from the middle line to the outside white line, to the middle line, outside white line. And it's ping pong back and forth. And if you've ever seen a motorcycle in your rear mirror, you know that if that headlight turns, you know, it almost looks like a half moon. It, it loses part of that circle. But this is a full circle, about 15 inches in diameter, darting and you can see it darting and as it darts center line to edge line it's getting faster and uh, I started praying to Jesus real hard because I didn't know what that light was and I floored that little Toyota Tacoma as fast as it would go um, and when I hit about 120 I, I lost the light and I didn't see it behind me anymore and I got home and I uh, thank the Lord that he got me home and I don't know what that light was and I really don't want to find out what that light was. <laughs> okay. Set the context of the story. Context of the story. So the context of the story is in um, Middle Kentucky, which is where my family is from. Um, and the context behind it is this would be my great great grandmother so she was my uh, i guess three greats because this is my grandmother's grandmother um she was born in the late 1800s she had i think she had seven or eight children and she was a midwife by trade so all these small communities she'd go you know help deliver babies and she had a, a, a bunch of wonderful stories and she told she raised my grandmother her daughter didn't raise my grandmother my my 
grandmother was raised by this woman. Her name was, we all, they all called her Mimi. I never got to meet her. She died in the 80s. Um, my father thought the world of her. And she told the story to my grandmother, who told it to me, that in the, I believe it was in the 20s, she, her husband was off um, working. He wasn't in the area. You know, this was right close to the, they were getting on the edge of the Great Depression. And he would go, he would be either um, working in a factory or they had all kinds of different jobs they would do. And then they also had a farm. So he was not at home. And I believe she had gotten done with a birth. And this was very late. And she had, again, it was somewhere around seven or eight children. But her youngest was a, a, a boy of seven. And he had been sick. And the doctor had come checked on him. He had been running a fever. And, you know, not really sure what it was. But, you know, comfort care and take care of him. So she had been at a birth, I believe. And she was coming back to her house. Again, Mimi never had a driver's license. Never drove a car. They didn't have any of this. I think they had one truck that her husband was using. As she's coming through the woods late at night in the hills of Kentucky, she sees behind her what she described as a lantern. And probably my grandmother said she said it was maybe 200 yards behind her. So she didn't think anything about it. There were other houses and different farms in this area. She said so it wouldn't have been uncommon. But she keeps walking through the woods and she's kind of going down a path that is only towards her house. So she's gotten where nobody else can follow her. The lantern's gotten closer. So she stops. Every time she stops, the lantern stops. But every time she moves forward, the lantern gets closer. So she gets to a big field where her house is at the end of the field. And she said that this was it. She wasn't letting this lantern get any closer to her. So she takes off running across the field and she gets to the house. She turns around and looks back from the porch and the lantern is dancing at the edge of the woods that she was just at. And it's just kind of bobbing and dancing. She said, so she goes inside, locks the door, puts out the light that was in there. Um, and she looks back out the window and the lantern rushes faster than anybody can run across the field towards the house. And she said she lay down on the floor and it started dancing on the front porch. And it was bobbing and just jumping around. She said it could it would light up through the house. And then all of a sudden it was gone. And she went into her son's bedroom who was sick. Again, seven, eight years old boy. And he said, Mama, I can see, I can see him coming for me. And I, and I, and I know I've got a crown of glory. She was a devout Christian, and I believe her son was a Christian. And uh, he passed away the next morning. So, that's one of those incidents that you have to trust Jesus in, absolutely because I don't know what that was, but I know my grandmother wouldn't lie to me and I know she didn't lie to her. So that's one of those things that it's hard to explain. But it's all another opportunity to hold close to Jesus. <laughs> so all that being said, what does all of this mean? What are some logical explanations for all this? Surely there is some. Well, for Sam, this could be it. Bears that have been born deformed or lost limbs can learn to walk upright by people. And if you see one of these in the woods, it could be quite unnerving. That being said, there's a lot of other things in these legends that don't sound like bears. Uh, these stories go all throughout history. The English poem Beowulf his opponent, Grendel, sounds a lot like a Bigfoot. I don't know. What about Dogman? Again, these stories are all throughout history, but one possible explanation is this. 
me personally having seen one of these and shot one, if you saw a black wolf or coyote with the mange in the middle of the night, just with a candle or a little lantern, kerosene lantern, it could be a very unnerving sight. And it wouldn't take very much for your imagination to run wild. Again, but there's a lot of other things, a lot of other accounts that don't sound like wolves or coyotes. I don't know. The orbs. This is the most discomforting to me. I, I don't know what they are. I don't want to know. I don't know if they're physical, spiritual, or something different. That being said, I want to share with you something I know definitively, without a doubt. It comes from 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of sound mind. Also, the Apostle Paul warns us uh, when talking about things such as the book of Enoch. Do not go chasing after this foolishness. Don't get caught up in chasing ghosts and legends. And don't mess with things that we have no power to mess with. That being said, I believe there's a physical realm and a spiritual realm of this world. There are a lot of things that I don't understand and can't explain. But I do know that at the end of the day, God is sovereign over all of it. And that gives me peace. So until next time, this has been Indian Outdoors. Thank you so much for watching. Hit that like, share, and subscribe button. Have a good evening.